Welcome back, my fellow patients, to Save Our Republic Daily Video Broadcast. Uh, yesterday, I recited the entire Declaration of Independence and spoke to why it was such a fundamentally important document to mankind. Today, I'm going to do the same thing in connection with another document that was adopted in America, this time not by the government, but by a women's rights uh, suffrage and equality convention, which is the first of its kind, held at Seneca Falls, New York, in 1848. The moving force behind the sentiments and resolutions is Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who you might know partnered up with Susan B. Anthony in connection with women's suffrage and equality. It mimics, in a very brilliant and creative way, the Declaration of Independence, basically borrowing much of the language and arguments with regard to uh, women's equality in connection with the Declaration of Independence. And you'll see what I mean in just a moment. Um, it talks about the importance of women being part of the social compact, that they have the right to consent to being governed, that they have a right to equality, uh, that the rule of law and inalienable rights and limited government all applies to them, and that they have a right to alter or abolish an oppressive government, just like the Declaration of Independence. So take a step back and enjoy. When in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one portion of the family of man to assume among the people of the earth a position different from that which they have hitherto occupied, but one to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to such a course. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men and women are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. When any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people who suffer from it to refuse allegiance to it and to insist upon the institution of a new government, laying its foundation such principles and organizing its power such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable, than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuse and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Such has been the patient sufferance of the women under this government, and such is now the necessity which constrains them to demand the equal station to which they are entitled. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward women, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. The history of mankind is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations on the part of man toward women, having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over her. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He has never permitted her to exercise her inalienable right to the elective franchise. He has compelled her to submit to laws in the formation of which she had no voice. He has withheld from her rights which are given to the most ignorant of degraded men, both natives and foreigners. Having deprived her of her first right of a citizen, the elective franchise, thereby leaving her without representation in the halls of legislation, he has opposed her on all sides. He has made her, if married, in the eye of the law, civilly dead. He has made her morally an irresponsible being, as she cannot commit many crimes with impunity, provided they be done in the presence of her husband. In the covenant of marriage, she is compelled to promise obedience to her husband, he becoming, to all intents and purposes, her master, the law giving him power to deprive her of liberty and to administer her chastisement. After depriving, after depriving her of all rights as a married woman, if single and the owner of property, he has taxed her to support a government which recognizes her only when her property can be made profitable to it. He has monopolized nearly all the profitable enjoyments, and from those she is permitted to follow, she receives but a scanty remuneration. He closes against her all the avenues to wealth and distinctions, distinction which he considers most honorable to himself. As a teacher of theology, medicine, or law, she is not known. He has denied her the facilities for obtaining a thorough education, 
all colleges being closed to her. He allows her in church as well as the state, but a subordinate position claiming apostolic authority for her exclusion from the ministry and with some exceptions from any public participations in the affairs of the church. He has created a false public sentiment by giving to the world a different code of morals for men and women, by which moral delinquencies which exclude women from society are only tolerated but deemed account in man, little account in man. He has usurped the prerogative of Jehovah himself, claiming it as his right to assign for her a sphere of action when that belongs to her conscience and to her God. He has endeavored in every way that he could to destroy her confidence in her own powers, to lessen her self-respect, and to make her willing to lead a dependent and abject life. Now, in view of this entire disenfranchisement of one half of the people of this country, their social and religious degradation, in view of the unjust laws above mentioned, and because women do not feel themselves aggrieved, oppressed, and fraudulently deprived of their most sacred rights, we insist that they have immediate admission to all the rights and privileges which belong to them as citizens of the United States. In entering upon the great work before us, we anticipate no small amount of misconception, misrepresentation, and ridicule but we shall use every instrumentality within our power to effect our object. We shall employ agents, circulate tracts, petition to the state and national legislatures, and endeavor to enlist the pulpit and the press on our behalf. We hope this convention will be followed by a series of conventions embracing every part of the country. And so, my friends, uh, those words really propelled uh, the women's rights movement, the suffrage movement, the equality movement, and made a vast difference eventually for the rights of all men and women in the United States and across the world. Until next time, don't forget about America's Survival Guide at americasurvivalguide.com, which uh, this is extensively discussed in an entire chapter. At Patriot Week at patriotweek.org, in which uh, what I've just read is available online, as well as the Patriot Lessons American History and Civics podcast. God bless you. And God bless America.